Welcome to Talk the Dog, the show where we find a bone to pick and a take to give. These are not hot takes. These is dog takes. Can I talk that dog? Let's shut up and grind some tape. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome in on a Wednesday night. Got a little uh, life advice for you here to start. Um, I think all of the best of the best, the truly elite, and whether it be business, sports, or in life, those people are smart enough to take from those around them. If you find something that you can take from others and apply to your life for the better, by all means, go for it. In other words, we're talking about theft. That's what we're talking about tonight. If you like something, by all means, steal it, take it, apply it. Okay, football coaches are the epitome of this. Okay, they all have their own set of ideals about culture, work ethic, scheduling, habits, all of the stuff that make us individuals in this life, the things that make us us, we all have those as individuals. But when it comes to the fundamentals as football coach, uh, coaches, the ideals of how they go about their work, how they go about designing schematics, X's and O's, all of the things that win football games in the critical moments, those things have been drastically impacted by those around them on their come-ups through college football coaching or coaching in general, right? The world's best coordinator. And I mean the best coordinators in the sport. Those guys are innovators, don't get me wrong. But those are the very few, right? There are very few of those, okay? And just a couple of examples here just to show you how rare they are. Um, in my opinion, Kirby Smart and Glenn Schumann, kind of a, a, a joint effort here. They were innovators, if you will, um, when they innovated the 425 mint front defense. I think they were the first ones to kind of bring this nickel based odd out of even personnel, really nerdy football conversation. Everyone basically has adopted this version of football nowadays in college football. They were kind of the innovators of that. I thought Chip Kelly was an innovator when he began to manipulate pace with the combination of the modern RPO and spread offense, right? Mike McDaniels is a current innovator in the NFL with the way he's manipulating motion and putting things in. But to be honest, there's not a lot of these in the sport, right? There's not a lot of innovators. It's a lot of copiers. Right, a lot of imitators, not innovators. Okay, 99.9% .9 of college football coaches, professional football coaches, coaches in general, most of these people, and even businesses, okay, most of these things are innovations or uh, Im impersonations, right? Um, adaptations to something that was already created, right? 99.9% .9 of the chefs in the world aren't recreating recipes, they're spicing up old recipes. It's the same thing with football coaches. The rare ones are out here being innovators, okay? They're building upon game plans that were previously implemented by those prior to them, okay? And guess what? As long as you're a great teacher, okay, you can be a great football coach without being a great innovator. You can have a really, really long career being a, uh, uh, an impersonator who is a great teacher, okay? As long as you are that, as long as you are a great teacher, okay? And if I've studied this game enough, okay, if I teach this game well enough, okay, I can take the concepts and add them on to my offense or my defense, right? I can do those types of things. What are we talking about, Brooks? What the hell are you doing? You just went like five minutes talking about some nonsense about stealing identities as a football coach. Well, I'm gonna tell you what, Mike Bobo, Mike Bobo is a great thief. Mike Bobo is an exceptional thief, and it must mean he's an exceptional teacher, okay? Mike Bobo is swiper, no swipey level, level of thief. Mike Bobo is John Dillinger. Mike Bobo is Jesse James. In the last two weeks, I've seen Mike Bobo use cheat motion, the motion that Mike, Daniels, uh, Mike McDaniels has put into the NFL recently, right? In the last two weeks, I've seen him use a Fox screen with a, a, a fake tunnel to uh, you know Dylan Bell, or excuse me, to Brock Bowers with a tunnel action behind with Dylan Bell, or however they did the swing motion that he stole from Oregon two weeks prior. I saw him do a very similar fake screen action that South Carolina used against Georgia a couple of weeks prior, right? I've seen the uh, tush push, if you will, be acclimated into their, uh, you know, uh, QB sneak action. I, we saw Roro this uh, this week, right? We tweeted it out today. We saw the the Super Bowl action where hey, we run the guy in motion on the goal line, make him transfer, make make that guy in man coverage run across, and then boom, snap the ball and run a little whip return. We've seen the guy steal and implement really really well. But here's the deal: 
every coordinator, even the bad ones, are thieves, man. They all steal concepts that they like. That's not the key. The key is to be able to steal them and add them onto your identity. I think the one thing that Mike Bobo has done a really good job this year of is maintaining what Georgia offense has been over the last two or three years, okay, and adding on these little spices, these little additions that he's stolen or manipulated or, or, or watched and observed from other versions of football and brought on to this Georgia offense. I think he's done an exceptional job of adding on to the identity without changing the core of this Georgia offense. Welcome into tonight's show. We've got a loaded one for you. Where we were right, where we were wrong. Kirby flipped a commit from LSU today. We're going to talk about that. Andre Evans, the defensive back, He's listed as an athlete. Breaking news here. He's going to probably play defensive back at the University of Georgia. Will Georgia get jumped? Okay, in the AP polls, we'll talk about that a little bit today. And for the first time in a long time, I think Georgia fans are going to be rooting for someone other than Georgia football this weekend. I know it is a bye week for you guys, but there's some other things going around the SEC. I want to welcome the boys in today. Boys, how are we doing today? Doing great. Hump yeah, not day. all at once. Hump day. Hump day. I usually go first. I was going to let him go first. Dude, time. it is that, is that time of the year where I just got that funk. I got that funk, that gunk in, in my face. It, it's, you know, when it first gets cold and when the pollen first starts to drop, uh, that, that's when it gets yeah. me. That was me last month. Yep. I feel that like I'm, I'm past too. it now. And what I like, what, what I prefer right now, what I'm, I'm happy about is it's just drainage. It's loose. As long as it's loose, we good out here. Um, as soon as it starts to ball up, get tight, oof, that's, that's troublesome. Hey, make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button. Make sure you like, subscribe, rate, review it, all that good stuff. Want to give a quick shout out to the folks over at Prize Picks, okay? Uh, you know, it is coming up on Thursday. You got Thursday Thunder tomorrow. Uh, Friday, they got some good stuff over there at Prize Picks as well. If you head over to prizepicks.com today, use promo code Brooks, okay? You will get 100% deposit match. What does that mean? You put in up to $100, they will match you instantly with $100. Also want to give a quick shout out to the Athletic Collection, our folks, our poster folks over there. If you're one of these folks like us that has some wall space around your crib and you want to get up some dope posters of your favorite football team or baseball team, head over to the Athletic Collection today and all of those proceeds, not all of those proceeds, a portion of those proceeds will go to those athletes. It is an NIL little play here on the channel. So support the Athletic Collection today. Head over there. The link is in the bio of the show notes today. Also, uh, a, a one night shout out should have been a multiple night shout out. This is my bad. A lot of things going on here. But Mark Rick had his Chick-fil-A dog bowl tonight out there in Athens. It was a massive event. Over 30 Georgia football players bowling. Dog Nation was co- uh, courteous enough to go out there and live stream on their website. So there was a bunch of coverage, but you can still go donate today. Uh, the link for that is in the bio as well. That goes to Parkinson's and I believe um, Crohn's, Crohn's, disease. Crohn's disease as well. So a lot of good causes there to be throwing your money at uh, and, and for a good reason, okay? So those links are in the bio today. Support all of those good and, 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 and plentiful causes, okay? Appreciate you guys. Let's get on after it. Um, we did where we were right, where we were wrong on NBR last night. I like doing this, especially because we have like a lengthy uh, track record now as a show. We're almost three months into this little venture as a, as a cohort and as a, as a team. So we've got a bunch of these. Uh, one of my, what, where I was right, most proudest moments, one of them uh, so far in the analysis on the Georgia beat this year was the fact that I, I kind of call it like, it's hard to go into a season with a first year starter and be like, they're going to lead the country in third down efficiency. Like, what? Hmm. Like, nah, that's, that's, that's a tough down. They're, they're like, if anywhere he struggles, he's going to struggle there in a first-year starter. And I just, I just had a gut feeling. I had a gut feeling that, that everything that I thought about the, the spring tape and the tape that we saw during the season last year from Carson Beck brought me to the word processor. Processors are great on third down. They've been elite on third down this year was 100% right there. And we've been calling that one since, I mean, before uh, SEC Media Days. That, that was a summer call out here on the network. Yeah, you mm-hmm. called that one for a minute. Yeah, literally the best in the nation amongst all quarterbacks. <laughs> you nailed it as far as anything better than that. Uh, this is a collective one that we were all right about, and not that this is one that we can like pin it on the wall and forever say it, but we were right about Brock Bowers just being fed this year and absolutely yeah. being fully involved with um, Mike Boba, offensive coordinator. They did He did everything and everything he could to get him the football in all sorts of ways and make sure that Brock Bowers got his. Of course, the injury kind of puts a stop to that. But. It's, it's dope to see that, uh, you know, 
tracking histories of coordinators still works. Like you're not suddenly going to become some new person. Mm -hmm. um, granted, the personnel becomes new for you, but your identity as a coordinator, his identity as a coordinator has been, I'm going to feed my guys. Yeah. And we knew that coming into the season. And it wasn't just, this is what's great about, I mean, his experience has played a major role in their success this year as an offense. And his ability to transition experience has played a major role in that. But it, like experience gives us a long track record of who you're fitting to be. And we knew they were fixing to be a feed Brock Bowers football team, mm -hmm. and they were that. So now it's, hey, feed, feed, feed the next best guy, which we'll get to it a little bit later, I think. But I, I think it's going to be Ra Ra Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what else we got? You got one for us? So, yeah, I also had Brock Bowers being force fed was right about that. Um, I'm kind of proud of this one. I said that Makai Muse would have a special teams touchdown this year, and he did it, what, game two or three? And, and he did it against Ball State, I think. That's not only, like, a, a, a solid-ass prediction. That's a first time in, like, six years prediction. Yeah. I think that goes back to 2007 or 18, 18 with uh, Cole Miko Hardman. Hardman. I think he did it against Buffalo. Yep. So that, that's a that's a deep callback. You're going back five years on something. Mm -hmm. you, you nailed something. You know, six years on something. You nailed it right there. Um, kind of a eh. Was right, was wrong on the offensive line this year. I mean, going into the season, I was I, I was out here talking about, hey, this might be a shoe in for a Joe Moore award. Uh, didn't really hit that. They're, they're gaining their stride, but they did not start like that, right? Um, Tate Rattledge and Cedric Van Prant have picked it up the last three or four weeks. I thought they played exceptionally well uh, in a time that they needed to play well when other moving parts were going around them. Uh, I know Tate's gotten some flack on social media and, and message boards and different things like that. I think that's kind of not necessarily nonsense, but but you got to understand Tate's a football player that when he misses, he's going to miss really bad because um, he's he's big. He's very he's a very large human being, and when he tends to fall off of a block, he's falling face first over his toes, um, and that tends to look very very ugly. Or he's turned around, and he doesn't he doesn't lose gracefully like a Cedric Van Pran does or like an Ernest Green does. Ernest Green. Really, really graceful loser right now on tape when he does lose. Um, but was kind of right, kind of wrong there. Uh, they look like they're picking it back up, but uh, was way wrong on trust, uh, trusting the eval from people in the building more than I trusted the eyes on tape. The eyes on tape told me Xavier Trust has always been a leaner. He's always been an up and down, you know, performance guy. He, he's played here and there. Spot playing's okay. You know, we, he, he's a serviceable starter. Bro, word out of camp was like, nah, dude, we got NFL guys coming in here asking about this guy. He's really, really this, that, and the other. He's going to start a lot of football games, has not played like a – but, dude, I'm, I'm, I, people I trust in the building were like, top 50 pick this year. He has not played like that. So, um, yeah, kind of right, kind of wrong there. Mm -hmm. Was right about Tyke Smith and that him being an impactful player at the star position, especially with him being 100% healthy. He already has four interceptions on the season. If he gets another, he'll be the first player since Dominic Sanders in 2014 to have more than five, four 16. interceptions, 16, more than four interceptions in a season. Right. That was that was a Kirby transfer from Alabama, correct? Dominic no, Sanders? That, no, he's that's there. Dom, that's not Dominic Sanders. Who's no. the other guy? You're Murray thinking Smith. Um, Murray Smith. Mm. Mo Smith, that's right. My yeah, bad. Mo Smith. Real, real football historian, real Georgia football historian here. Um, sometimes I think it's easy to forget that I'm, I'm really, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. freshly new to this, mm -hmm. like basically. Um, yeah. So he's been an absolute difference maker and playmaker for Georgia there at the star position. Was right about that. So I was kind of right and kind of wrong about this. I figured, and we all kind of hinted at it, that the running back room would look for help somewhere else, yeah. position wise. I did not think it was going to be Dylan though. That yeah. one really surprised me. I was wrong about that. I thought it was going to be mainly Brock Bowers, who I even said he would have 25 carries by the end of the season, and I don't think he's going to get that. So that's why I was wrong and right. We, we have done a bad job as of late of us responding or reading, you know, chat comments or chat questions. Um, Heath Williams asked a good question here. Hey, guys, quick question about Bobo. Are people still hating on Bobo like they were earlier in the season? I think that's finally died off. Mm -hmm. I think I think man says what well, it might be a direct re uh, re reflection of the quarterback play. The quarterback plays look really, really good. Um, so there's not I feel like those two one or one of the, the two are connected. The quarterback's looking flatter or flustered and the passing game looks congested. The coordinator gets shit on that hasn't necessarily and you haven't been in a lot of third and long. So you hadn't seen a lot of Bobo yeah. screens or Bobo draws that y'all hate so much. So uh, no, I don't I don't think the hatred. For Bobo is there so much. Uh, where I was wrong, coming into the season, I was just as heavy on the Carson Beck third down stuff as I was Damon Wilson third down roll on the defensive side of the football. And uh, I, I think I've learned my lesson. Until they stop playing three inside linebackers on third down, I'm just going to stop with this predictions. 
Okay, their, their rabbit package in years past has been Smile, Mondon, Xavier, and Story, and whoever's playing Mike. Um, so if, if it's going to remain that, uh, then I just, we're, we're going to back off of all the jacks. You know, like the jack position just, it's, 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 it's troublesome. And, and the other thing is like, when you get into third and long against Georgia, the last thing you want to do is hold the football. Like they never really design like, well, you know, two and a half, three second hold, hold the ball plays, driving the ball down the field type of plays. So they, they prioritize speed on the field. And if you're going to prioritize speed on the field, then you're not going to be playing edge rushers. You're going to be playing linebackers like Xavier and Sori. It, it just, to me, going into the season, I looked at the roster and I said, hey, third and eight, they need somebody to speed rush, get home immediately. Who's it going to be? Thought it was going to be Damon Wilson. Hasn't really found a role there yet. So mm -hmm. I was wrong on that. Were you guys just 100% right this year? There's no No, I'm, I'm about to tell you. Come on. Wrong last Come time. on. Where, where, where were we wrong? I was wrong in thinking that Dejan Edwards was the second best running back in this running back room. I've, yeah. you, were, I've, you were a Kendall guy? Yeah, I, I've, I've, I've always felt like when Kendall's 100% healthy, I think he's the best running back in the room. But I think Dejan has proved that wrong, and I think he has proven that he is the best running back in that room. And I, I've always – like, if you ever needed a positive pickup, Dejan has always been the guy that if you just need to keep picking up yards, if you need to keep keeping a drive alive, that's who Dejan is. That's why when it gets down in the fourth quarter mop-up duty, that's why he was the guy that was put in there. But I was wrong in thinking that he wasn't capable of being your bell cow back. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you were 100% wrong there. I, I always thought he was super, super talented. Now, I didn't – the, the college talent's obvious to me. The next question is, like, what does he look like on the NFL stage? Mm -hmm. um, and does he, he's going to get an opportunity just because he's been so uber successful. And the tape, is, the tape is crazy. Like, when you watch it, you're, you, you, you're left scratching your head going, how did he, how did he do that? And I think um, even if he doesn't get, like, highly drafted, the moment he gets on a roster and they see him in camp, like, like get to run behind an offensive line, they're going to be like, damn, this dude really maximizes – what's available on the uh, on the field, which is kind of the definition of the position. Um, was very, very right with the Ra-Ra Thomas stuff coming on strong late. Now, I didn't expect it to be like 100% needed due to an injury, not like it is now, but um, going into the season, I thought it was pretty obvious that eventually he was gonna, you know, kind of take over a role as a, as a prominent weapon. Mm. You got any more? Yeah, so. I hate to say I was wrong about this because he hasn't been playing bad by any means, but I thought Michael Williams would be a household name in the country defensively this year. Yeah. He hasn't really just jumped off the page statistic-wise. And no one at Georgia does that. That's kind of the whole idea of the no-name defense. But I really thought he would have a bigger season this year than he has. I thought the first three or four games on tape, he, he flew around yeah. like, like something crazy. Um, he was having a really, really disruptive tape first three or four games. Um but I, I, I'll be honest, I haven't, like, the last couple of weeks when I go to watch tape, I don't watch them. They haven't, they don't flash. That defense line has not flashed this year, but they haven't flashed for good or bad reasons. It's been a very B-minus performance. Like, if I were to, if I were to grade, it's like an 84 overall, okay? But they don't have negatives. Like, they're, they're a very high floor football team right now in between the tackles. Uh, and even Michael, you're right, he has not. The last couple of weeks has not like flashed off the tape, which is kind of his thing. That's what yeah. he does. Um, but yeah, a couple of plays. I should say I shouldn't say. Hey, a couple of plays Saturday where it's yeah. like, no, you're the best player on the field. Yeah, it's not like he's playing bad at all whatsoever. Yeah. It's I, I predicted it to be more like a Jalen Carter where he's just a game record. It's like holy shit, where did this guy come? Yeah, from? they don't have that. No. Um, and it, it has impacted their. I think it's impacted their third down success rates because they're they're not. I, I, I would be curious if we could run down. I know I, I do this to you during the show all the time. But if we could run down their average third down, like convert, like what are they facing on third down? What are their oppositions facing on third down? I bet it's like a, a good yard or two shorter than what they were last year. Like last year, if they were averaging oppositions third and six and a half, I bet this year it's like third and four and a half, third and five. Uh, and that's, that's a difference in uh, a TFL on second and medium. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's been the difference this year. For this defense, so yeah, I, I we were we were all kind of wrong in the sense that we expected him to have like a like a first round All American type performance, but I think sometimes we forget he's still a sophomore football mm, player. Yeah. Like that's wild. He's and, still only twenty years old, and you just don't get that a lot on the Georgia defense because there's so much talent and there's so many guys that are standing out that it's kind of it's what it is the no name defense. Yep. 
I think we can all collectively agree on this one, but I'll put it on myself. I was wrong in thinking that Georgia was just going to cruise through this schedule until they got to Ole Miss. I mean, yeah. Yeah, because you looked at the schedule preseason, and you're like, okay, South Carolina will give you a little nod there. Auburn, only because it's on the road. Other than that, should be easy sailing. Vanderbilt whatsoever, but there's been some bumps in the road, and there's been, of course, some moments where like, mm, let's stop and think a little bit here. Maybe there's um, some gaps on this football team. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, still have looked phenomenal for the most part, but mm-hmm. hasn't been like the typical like forty to seven or every week. The the chat's bringing up a name right now that recalls of where I was right, and it wasn't this season. I didn't call for it to happen this season, but been calling for it since he was in high school. Kristen Miller's played exceptional on early downs. Yeah. Now, um, I I don't I don't know. I guess it's the older guys in front of him. And we'll get to see a major role next year. But, like, every time he's in the, the game, I feel like he is a, a run stopper. He, he creates some of these uh, missing, you know, havoc plays that were available all over these last couple of years for this Georgia defense and has, uh, you know, created some third and mediums, some th- third and longs with, with second down run, uh, run game success. Um, so, yeah, I was right on that one. Was uh, trying to think about another one. Um, I was right about Ole Miss being the toughest game on the schedule. Mm. I still think that stands true. You um, think you're right. You know, coming to this season, I, I, that was my one of my takes. It was like everybody was, hey, everybody's overlooking that that Ole Miss game going into that Tennessee matchup, and here we are midway through the season. And if if we had a 12 team playoff right now, do you think the committee puts Ole Miss in? Right now, right, right now, now, probably not. Committee, not AP poll. Committee, big time SEC bias historically has a signature okay. also win. likes brand names mm-hmm. also likes signature wins also likes top end talent okay also likes line of scrimmage play you know what i'm saying okay. so like old miss much better football team uh than maybe even i even thought coming to the season but i thought it was definitely gonna be the toughest match they could easily be put in at 12 right now mm-hmm. Ab- absolutely i think they're 13th in the ap poll right now i wouldn't argue with 12 or 13 i mean i'd have to look at it in depth obviously but that seems about right uh we were right in, in the sense that, like, preseason, I thought everybody knew that this was going to be kind of a uh, passing offense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, hey, a little banged up in that running back core. I think we talked about it becoming much more of a horizontal-based offense. You know, we can protect for days. Let's run across the field. That was wrong. Okay, they remained vertical. Vertical as ever. They are, uh, you know, across the field running drags and digs against zones and getting into windows. But most of the time, most of their damage is, you know, getting up the field um, and, and attacking that way. So I was wrong on that, but right in the sense that they were a passing-oriented offense for the first time ever. 2016, maybe. Jacob Eason's first year. You guys, Georgia chunked it that year. No, I mean, a little had Sonny and it Chubb. still had Sony and Chubb, though. I, I remember looking at game logs where Jacob Eason had like 40 attempts. You're thinking of the Missouri game. Correct. Where they was stoked, that just a one-off? That was a one-off. They, yeah. okay. they force-fed Nick Chubb and Sonny Michelle. It was typical. Well, I was force-feeding Miller Lights in day at the office year, for so. A typical day at the office for Eason that year was like 25 attempts. All right, so I'll take that back. So first time in, in Kirby Smart's career, you guys are a, a quarterback and weapons-based offense. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. I mean, Georgia fans, doesn't that just make it move a little bit for you? I mean, God dang, that ain't never been the case. And that's been like the biggest complaint, I feel like, for years. We're not, you know, we're not fun enough on offense, essentially. (laughs) Yeah. We're not fun fun enough. Plenty fun nowadays on offense. So how about that? Mm -hmm. Um, We got any more? That's all I got. I was just going to say that we definitely can hang our hat on saying that people did not need to worry about Mike Bobo whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. I First two games. Worried you were a little bunchy uh, and a little, but he was just warming up, baby. He was just warming up. Nah, it, it looks like it's supposed to look right now. Where do we want to go next? Hmm. I want to see this Andre Evans tape. You, you've you seen this Andre Evans tape. I wanted to go blind yeah, into this. Let me rephrase. I want to see you react to it. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, uh, welcome in. Andre Evans flipped from LSU to uh, Georgia today. Uh, give you a little background on this because I called around today before I uh, wanted to do this segment and just kind of get the backstory on this, uh, how this happened, who's to credit for this, what's going on. Uh, this was a Fran Brown, a uh, little, little, <laughs> little doop de doop right here. Just in like the last probably for like 14, 15 days, uh, it sounds like they've really made moves on this athlete. Um, and that's exactly what he is. Uh, I, I just did some highway speed intel on him uh, from, from people inside the building. 
uh, about a verify as verifiable of a six one as you can have. Okay, at the corner position or what they want to play the corner position, and he's a verified ten five five runner in the hundred. Nice. Box check, box check. Like that's basically the requirements nowadays uh, to play corner at Georgia or to play defensive back in general at Georgia. We're gonna have a blind reaction on this tape, but uh, this was a Fran Brown special, and I was telling the guys before the show, and I've mentioned this on this show today or before in in you know weeks and months and shows past. Okay, but I think it bears repeating. There are two football coaches in the sport, last time I checked, that are represented by Richie Sexton, okay, that aren't head football coaches. And by the way, there's like three agents that represent the entire, like, pool of head coaches in the, in the sport, okay? There are very few of these names, okay? Richie Sexton being one of them as a premier agent. He has two clients that are not head coaches in the sport. One of them is Jeff Levy, the offensive coordinator at Oklahoma. The other one is Fran Brown. Okay, why would uh, Richie Sexton have those two guys as clients? Well, because one day down the road, probably pretty soon, he projects them to be very well-paid head coaches, okay, and in that pool of head coaches. That's what the sport, okay, thinks of Fran Brown, um, and he's performed that way during his time at the University of Georgia, and this was a Fran Brown special. Let's take a look at it. I haven't seen this. Okay, I, I love a little – Blind reaction um, to the tape. So, uh, but I will. I will say this: You gave me a little teaser. You said it's got everything we need to see. Everything. everything. A little bit of everything. A little bit of everything. A little bit of spice. A little bit of a little bit of everything. Nice. Here we go. Let's take a look. Here we go. All right. Uh, is this special teams? No. This. Oh, this is run it down. Show me the gas. Oh, long strider. Long strider. Okay. What does that mean, Brooks? Well, he don't have one of these. <laughs> he don't look like one of those. He's one of these. He's one of these. Okay. I love me a long strider. Not a ton of knee drive there, but not, not typical in a long stride. Okay, here we, here we go. We got some man coverage. Let's see. We're going to get some ball skills here, Jay Will. We're going to get some ball skills here, Jay Will. I can smell it. I can smell it. Oh, he attacked it. He attacked it. He climbed over that dude's back shoulder. I like that. I like that. Playing with inside leverage, doesn't bite on the double move. We get to see some reacceleration there. That's a major key, right? Hey, if you're a if you're a long strider, if you're one of these build speed dudes, I want to make sure we can change your direction speed because we're a corner, right? I think, hey, not to be this guy, but Kiwi Ringo kind of got exposed in this during his career, right? Hey, 10, 300 meter runner, a big physical guy. Everybody's like, ooh, Kiwi Ringo, right? Kiwi Ringo's change of direction gets him beat, all right, because he can't start and stop. It's kind of one of the major keys to play in man-to-man -man coverage. This dude's got some of that ability. Oh, way to drive down the route. Yes, sir. Take it to the crib. That's some ball skills. Oh, gave me a little Dion there at the end, too. We got some swag about us. I like that. Okay, some communication. What do we got? We got off coverage, drive down the route, physicality. Okay, we, buy, we checking boxes. You're right, Jay Will. We're checking boxes, man. We got ball skills. We've seen the athleticism. We've seen the physicality. We've seen communication skills. Okay, we've seen just about everything. We playing offense now? I think we're playing offense now. So now we're about to see you track it. Let's see how well you track the football. Ooh, not, not a refined, refined, refined route runner. That's, a, ooh, that's okay. That's the way to track the football. Hey, envision we are, you know, in a cover three turn, right? We're out here, and we got outside leverage instead of inside leverage. We're playing out here. Ooh, that's a big old pin right there. We're playing outside leverage here, all right? We still, as a corner, when we're in zone coverage, can you remember? Yeah, I got you. When we're in zone coverage, we're like this, right? Our eyes on the quarterback. When the ball is in the air, we still got to be able to do this, baby. We still got to be able to track it over our shoulders. All right? This is exactly a, a rep right here, an example of that. Ooh. Good ball from the Q. I see you. Tennessee football? Huh? Tennessee football? What? Okay. We're just we're – just, oh, we'll come back here. Uh, ball skills. Uh, your your – your, uh, Ability to control your body. Okay. Oh, are we a blocker? Are we a blocker too? Are we a teammate, sir? I like it, Andre Evans. I like it, Andre Evans. That's some good tape, boys. That's some good tape. What is the uh, the track record? I I, I would want to go back and, and track the flips. You know what I mean? How, how they've done at Georgia when Kirby has like selectively flipped them, mm -hmm. or one of his position coaches has selectively flipped them. Hmm. Uh, Ad Mitchell is a prime example of this. They saw him committed to the Ole, uh, Ole Miss uh, class. They went through and they're like, hmm, I like that. They called him up. They flipped him. 
Okay, Jermaine Burton, one of these. Okay, George so, Pickens. So far, not a great track record. George Pickens, pretty good. Okay, so we're doing this off the cuff here. Um, George Pickens was a late addition in terms of like, they always recruited him, but they really, really drove in late to flip him. Monty Rice, Monty Rice is an example of this. Wasn't he a UCLA guy? They came in late oh, and flipped oh, him. Roquan was UCLA. Roquan. He's not Kirby. No, he's not Fromm. Kirby. Fromm. Fromm is an yeah, example Fromm of this. Carson Beck, mm -hmm. an example of this, was an Alabama guy. They brought him in later towards the end of the class. Um, Brock Vandergriff. No, that yeah. was January. That was January of his year. He decommitted from Oklahoma in January of his senior year and was committed by February to Georgia, and they wrote it out because he was like a big-time recruiting guy for them during the COVID cycle. Um, I'm trying to think of some more of these because they do this every, every cycle because they've been pretty much done with their class. They've been kind of hanging out, doing whatever it is that they do when they have 28 commits in the middle of July. They've been just kind of identifying somebody that they like that they want to go flip. And they, like I said, they do this pretty much every mm – -hmm. normally they do it in December. They don't do it in October. But they're a little bored right now, it seems, on the recruiting trail. <laughs> they're going to – hey, by the way, if you're on patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin, they're going to do it to a receiver that's committed to an ACC school pretty soon as well. So that, this is what they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if there's any more. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but – does the chat have any? I don't think they did. I didn't see But anyways, any. hey, this is a great point in the chat. Make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button uh, over there on YouTube. That's how we get up, 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 up. That's how y'all continue to support this here show. So, yeah, man, that, that's some good tape. Thoughts on Andre Evans and, and where he might slide. Hey, before y'all do it, I, bro, I, I have never heard anything but good news about Ellis Robinson and his, his firm, firm commitment to the University of Georgia. Uh, that dude spent uh, uh, an, not – unusual that dude spent a lot of time on the field during his unofficial visit the other day just soaking up everything during that last home game so the dude is very very committed to the g per my uh both sourcing and observations of that individual and he's a great one oh, okay yeah. he is a great <laughs> great football player you saw him out there in la didn't you uh, I didn't went, see him in LA, but I've you just know, you didn't go to the Elite Eleven with us. No, uh, we saw him out there. Uh, you know, the Elite Eleven and the uh, OTA uh, OT I've seen Seven the of Finals. Him. Yeah, and he was out there against Jeremiah Smith. Like, bro, <laughs> that dude is so crazy. He is such a good corner. Uh, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't say this a lot about freshmen. He he might he has a very very good shot of coming in and starting as a true freshman next year. Really? He's that good. He's that good of a cover corner. He's that much of a Sunday guy um, with no holes. Like even Keeley, when I watched him in high school, I was like, ooh, way too tall. Plays too tall. Like it's good to be tall, but we can't play tall. We can't play 6'2". Um, Keeley to this day plays 6'2 sometimes. Um, so we can't do that. Uh, but this kid, this kid, no holes at all. But Andre Evans, a solid, <laughs> solid, very uh, similar body type to, you know, like a guy like Nylon Green. Mm -hmm. um, with, with way more track speed. Nile wasn't a track kid at all. Mm. So yeah. based on based on what I saw over there, that that's a good prospect to have. Just an all around athlete. That's a good thing to have in your defensive back room. Chat said uh Cade Mays as a flip. Yeah. Cade Mays is a flip, a selective flip. I'm trying to there's gotta be more of these. Wasn't Bretton Cox a flip? I don't remember. Yeah, he was Ohio State for a little bit, I wanna say. Hmm. Fields, too, technically. I mean, would you count that one? Not really. Hmm. Um, Chat saying, I always thought Keeley was a safety. Never hit like that, ever. No. Um, ability and willingness was the discussion we had with that, right? Do you have the ability to do it? Yeah. Do you have the willingness to want to do that? Maybe not. Like, playing safety kind of sucks. I'm not going to be honest. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. Um, it is the modern-day fullback defensively. <laughs> Name me another position on the field that has to build up a, that much of a running head start and smack their head against the wall. I'll wait. You win. You ain't got one. You ain't got one. The safety position, in my opinion, nowadays, like, because linebackers are much more like they're running directly horizontal nowadays, half the plays. They're running straight down the line trying to tackle a guy before he gets upfield and sticks his foot in the ground. And not saying it's not physical, but when it comes to guys building up speed and striking, safeties are, are, are playing a whole different game. Um, did y'all hear that Brent Cox uh, got dismissed from Florida? No way. Yeah. When? That was like last year, wasn't it? He gets exposed every got time. Him. He gets nah, exposed I'm every time as a non-Discord family member. It is weird. It is weird to have such a large family 
watch this show, love this show, invest in this show, and then have someone on the show that's just like, what's going on over <laughs> there in that other universe? With it. Yeah, keep keep playing the bit. I like the bit. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, nah, man. If you're not over on Patreon and in that Discord, you should be. If you ever found yourself wondering, like, during the workday, man, I really wish there was some place where I could just not do work and talk to, like, you know, some like-minded Georgia fans that care about, you know, learning about football, having fun, uh, and just hanging out. Patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin not only comes with elite film analysis, up-to-date information about your favorite football team, but it also comes with a community over there on Discord as well. So, shouts out to Patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin. Hey, um, Georgia today got matched on FanDuel's college football playoff title odds for the first time all season. They've been the lone favorite to win the national title wire to wire until today. They were matched by Michigan at plus 270 for the college football playoff title. Thoughts on that first before I give you my pseudo question after that. I mean, first reaction is that's the Brock Bowers effect. Mm. And the fact that it looks like Ole Miss is going to be a top 15 team when you play him. Tennessee has the potential to be a top 10 team when you play him. So that cakewalk of a schedule isn't seeming like too much of a cakewalk anymore. And it's also the fact that Michigan's beat the shit out of everyone they played, despite the fact that they probably haven't played much of an opponent. They look really, really good. So, mm. Yeah, not really surprising. Kind of feel like – I mean, the last couple of weeks, I feel like the, it's been picking up steam of like, oh, is this the week that Michigan jumps Georgia? Is this the week that someone finally jumps Georgia in the AP poll? AP poll is stuck with them. But I think it's been kind of obvious that people are starting to favor the Wolverines a little bit. People are liking what they're seeing up there at Ann Arbor. Or Ann Arbor. Ann with, Arbor. Yeah, stumbling over my words. Um with Jim Harbaugh and them. So not really surprising, but. So I'm looking at it right now. Uh, Georgia last week had 45 top eight or AP top 25 votes. This week they had 43. Obviously they have a bye week this week. Michigan plays Michigan State. Yeah. Um, the team I would be, you know, if you're worried about this, which I know Georgia fans aren't, but streaks are cool. You know what I mean? Not necessarily streaking, but streaks are cool. And uh, having this AP t uh, top 25 number one overall streak is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And the one that I would be worried about is Ohio State jumping you this week if they kind of handle Penn State. Yeah, yeah that's part sure. of that. We can go into that in NBR because I've got that for what if Wednesday. But Because I kind of feel like with Ohio State too is people haven't fully jumped on board yet. Mm -hmm. But if you went and handled Penn State, then that would get everybody a reason to jump in on the Buckeyes and what Ryan Day and them are cooking up right now and a, a – a massive win over Penn State would surely pick up a lot of steam for them. Absolutely. Um, where should we go next? There's not much left on the slate. We have Auburn, uh, Georgia fans in a really peculiar situation, by Very the way. Very peculiar. Very peculiar situation this weekend. Um, obviously, the SEC is down this year. Now, we don't know. I, I think the CFP uh, first round of the rankings come out next week, right? It's after, after the Florida. Georgia Florida game, I believe. So next week, yeah, or two weeks, because they come out in two weeks. Now we will find out what the CFP thinks about the SEC that week. Um, but if the College Football Playoff Committee follows any of the narrative building that's been going around the college football world right now, they probably think the SEC is a little bit down as well. So if that is the case, then Georgia needs kind of every single one of their remaining opponents, or assuming they don't, you know, win out kind of needs the rest of their opponents to look relatively well, don't they? Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. Definitely. I, I mean, ten. but the, here's the thing. Do you really – this is the predicament you get into, especially with this Tennessee-Alabama game as a Georgia fan, is would it be nice for your schedule and for your strength of schedule and for your future opponents if Tennessee were to go in there, upset Alabama, and build up their resumes so that when, when you beat them it looks a little bit nicer for you? Absolutely. But I think also you would also like to have the safety blanket of Tennessee drops another SEC game mm. when you play them. Then you have some leeway a little bit if you go into Neyland Stadium, things aren't going your way, all momentum shifts to Tennessee, and you drop one possibly. But then you still are in front – you are still the front runner of the SEC East at that point. So that's where I would say you have to be a little bit cautious of like just saying, yeah, we want Tennessee to upset Alabama this week. We're just out here doing a bunch of speculative journalism. None of this matters if you went out, obviously, but yeah. that's boring. That's not a hot, that's not a topic we can talk about right now. Okay. Okay. I can just sit here and say, oh, went out. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, that's how I get out of a press conference if I'm Kirby Smart, but that's not a good podcast topic. 
I mean, the real question is, what's a worse loss? Losing to a two-loss Alabama in the SEC championship or losing to a two-loss Al- Tennessee on the road mm. in Neyland? What, what? That, that, that boils down the whole conversation. Yeah. You're right. Because that, that's basically what we're talking about this weekend where Georgia fans are going to be sitting at home watching a Tennessee versus Alabama game as they are every third, day, third Saturday in October. Okay, you're going to be sitting there watching that football game, and you're going to kind of want to root for Alabama or you're going to kind of want to root for Tennessee, or you're going to kind of have to make a decision because you want, you want your future opponent to look better. Which a future opponent, like Kirby just said, do you want to look better? Do you want both to be a two-loss football team, or do you want one of them to be a one-loss, kind of you know, relatively unblemished football team? Here's yeah. the question there. Who do you trust more to win this weekend and then win out? Bama. Because – of all the other things and, around the suspect. And here's another one. thing. Georgia lost to Auburn late in the season in 2017. You avenged it in the SEC championship game and you got in the cultural playoff. You could lose to Tennessee, go to the SEC championship game, avenge your loss in a sense against Alabama. You'd be, you'd be in the cultural playoff at that point, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can necessarily say you avenge that loss. The problem is if Tennessee doesn't lose to Alabama and they beat you, they're now in the SEC championship. No, that's why I was saying, like, you have to be yeah. careful in this situation of just saying, like, oh, we definitely want Tennessee to win because then yeah. they control their the destiny way, just as much as you. I think the way Georgia wins is if this game somehow ends in a tie. Chad's got a great point. Loss earlier in the season is better than late in the season Absolutely. when it comes to a college football playoff discussion. Absolutely. For sure. You have time to avenge a loss in the public yeah. forum. In the public That's what I was looking. getting at. Alabama and Tennessee yeah. are perfect examples of that. So the best loss on the schedule is Ole Miss because it's a, a non-divisional loss, okay, and it's a ranked opponent, mm-hmm. the highest-ranked opponent in your regular season schedule because the loss to Tennessee is basically end of the season. It's yeah. the second-to-last yeah. regular season game. All you got is Tech, and, and at that point, if you make the SEC championship game. Yep. Yeah. So, no, I, I also don't think – We'll get into an NBR. I, I don't think Tennessee wins this football game Saturday, but that, that's beside the point. Um, I do have notes from a scout. Do y'all want this? Sure. Ooh, yeah. This is pretty interesting stuff. I watch a lot of football. You guys know this. I have a lot of opinions. And um, it was funny. The first couple of years doing this, you know, I always try to talk to everybody. It's kind of my nature. It's who I am. It's, it's what I do. Uh, it's served me well in life. It's, it might be a uh, a skill set, honestly, the willingness to talk to anybody uh, will get you somewhere in life. Maybe not always in the right place, but it'll get you somewhere, uh, maybe into some trouble as well. Uh, but I've, I've had a chance to meet some of these NFL guys. The first couple of years when I did this, they were like, <laughs> get the fuck. Oh, no. <laughs> Zero days since saying the F word <laughs> on the network. No. We're going to have to get a sign. We're going to get a sign. Um, get the hell away from me, ugly guy. Um, nowadays, they see my face everywhere, and they, they see me at everywhere. They see, they see the opinions and whatnot, and they don't mind. They, they know that this guy kind of knows. You know what I mean? You have to earn that right, and I, I, I respect that nowadays. But um, was expa- exchanging some opinions today, uh, first about Michael Penix, but eventually it gets back to Georgia because they want to pick my brain um, and not just have a one-way conversation. Uh, but it's funny. Guys, Kamari Lassiter – this, this will be the test. And I love having tests like this because they expose people in the national media. Okay, not necessarily the scouting world. You're not going to hear opinions from scouts out there, you know, for actual NFL scouts. But these guys that get paid to give NFL draft opinions, they're going to expose themselves this year on Kamari Laster. Okay, and they already are in certain rankings. I've seen PFF uh, and, and other, like, websites, other national media outlets come out with their top 20 cornerback rankings. And guess what? Kamari Laster is not on them. Uh, because they're just checking either box scores or just watching the TV broadcast on Saturday. And you know who isn't getting thrown at right now? Kamari Lassiter. He is not. You know why? He's strapped. He's absolutely strapped. So you know who has been paying attention? The some bitches that are watching the All-22. All right? The guys who are actually tape watching. Okay, so if anybody that you respect is out here kind of not talking about Kamari Lassiter as an NFL corner... Lose some respect, all right, just a hair, all right, because they're not watching what they're supposed to be watching. He is an all-tape watcher right now. Um, they were in 100% agreement on the Cedric Van Pran of opinions. He's played really, really well. There's going to be a physical measurement that knocks him, okay? That, that, that it's not, it's not going to be a major knock. It's not going to be like, oh, my God, what the heck. It's going to be, a, okay, maybe we don't draft him in the top 25 picks type of knock uh, with Cedric. Uh, Carson Beck, the word is a uh, little bit of, how about this one, a little bit of C.J. Stroud. Hmm. A little bit of C.J. Stroud in the, in the comparisons, uh, flaw, uh, flawless mechanics, 
processors, okay? Not elite twitch as an athlete, but enough to make some stuff happen. What the NFL is waiting on is that 26, 27, 28 game sample size, okay? But once that happens, once they feel firm about that, we've been, t- we've been very consistent on this as well. NFL is very scared of one-year starters in college football nowadays. They're kind of waiting for that seasoning. They want to see, hey, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I want to see a 25, 26-game starting sample size. Okay, I think the, the stat I heard was some type of number of comp- uh, attempts. I think it's 900 collegiate attempts, something like that, that they want to see. Just because it's a repetition thing. I want to see you uh, time over time. Uh, so 2025 draft class, Carson Beck starting to be rumored in that, hey, Got to look out for. We, we need to be judging this guy in terms of a first-round draft pick. They, they think he's been making some ballsy throws, okay, some, like, NFL-type throws. We showed one on tape uh, this morning or yesterday morning on patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin. One of the incomplete balls to Lad McConkey on Saturday was a deep over where they're playing Tampa, too, so the, the, the middle linebacker from Vandy's got to turn. His back is to the defender. His back is to the ball, okay? So when the back is, or when the, the linebacker is not playing with his eyes to the quarterback, okay? And we got this deep over running this way, and this middle linebacker's got to turn, flip his hips, and start running in trail position like this. He's not looking at you as a quarterback. So I know my receiver is. So even though my receiver's running this way, if I want to throw a ball here and stop this guy and throw it over the back right shoulder of this linebacker, He's never going to get his head around. He's never going to be able to look at it. All right, these are the only types of balls you throw if you're going to play on Sundays. All right, when everything is covered, when everything looks like it's been taken care of defensively, and you throw an undefendable ball, okay, that's what Sunday throws look like. He's making a lot of those. He's made a lot of those over the last couple of weeks. And to me, it's shown ultimate confidence in his abilities. Like, when I see quarterbacks starting to make those types of throws, I'm like, all right, this guy's not only feeling himself, this guy's playing within the offense. He's very confident, um, and he has confidence of his teammates. So notice that as well. So wait, <clears throat> are you saying it's pretty much already a foregone conclusion that he stays after this year? I'm not breaking news there. I don't, I haven't, I don't, have any, I don't have it on good authority inside the building that that is the case. I'm just telling you, reading all the tea leaves, right, but like, he's coming back. That's what, that's what the NFL believes, at least scouting. That's what the NFL, yeah. It, okay. Like, they're evaluating him for 2025. Got it. Is what – now, that, that's not to say he might not come out. If he comes out, then they'll just evaluate him based off what they have, and it, his draft stock will be impacted by that. Okay, I'm just telling you, I, I think Carson Beck has first-round traits and abilities, but he has to have two years of tape for it to happen. If it, if it doesn't happen, you've seen the class this year. Mm-hmm. The yep. class just, the, this year has him being a third- or fourth-round draft pick if he comes out, which is fine, but he's not going to have an opportunity to start immediately if you're a third- or fourth-round draft pick coming out unless you're Davis Mills and you get lucky because you're drafted by Houston and then you get replaced anyways. Okay, that's not what you want. You want to be a first-round draft pick so they have five years worth of, you know, leash essentially. Justin Fields, if he were a third-round draft pick right now, would have far played his way out of a starting position, right? But he's a first-round draft pick so they're investing multiple, multiple seasons into what appears to be a monstrosity, okay, um, up there in Chicago, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, anyways, yeah, if he comes out this year, kind of a third round grade on that. NFL's agreement on what we had as a, where I was right, but we haven't, we, I didn't talk about it. Uh, tweeted about how the NFL was going to love Smile Mondon a little bit more than Pop. Uh, I think you guys, based off my mentions, y'all are very, very critical about Jamon Dumas Johnson's play this year. Um, you guys have kind of noticed it as well. The NFL loves the traits on Smile. How could you not? Um, that's a sub 11 second 100 meter runner at six foot two, 230 pounds. So yeah, that's an NFL football player. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys got anything? I, what, what was I going to say? I had something, but I lost my memory on it now. Love it. I mean, it's hard to argue with NFL scouts. Yeah, hard to. So what I feel else like we got? I was going to. Oh, I was going to say about Samile is that you could just kind of you could just kind of tell based on the way the NFL draft has gone, especially over the past couple of years, and how. It seems like the NFL has gone to this like, oh, you check all the boxes trait wise, and you have some r- r- decent tape. We'll we'll take a gamble on you in the first fifty picks of the NFL draft, without a doubt. Yeah, I don't know when you look at it. All right, so let's just talk this out right now. Okay, pull up our lads in the depth chart so we don't miss anybody. 
All right, let's go uh, Cedric Van Pran, probably gone, right? Out. Let's go Amarius Mims, probably gone. First round evaluation there, yep. probably gone. Um, Ra Ra Thomas, depending on how the rest of the season ends up, let's put 50, a question 50. mark next to him, 50, okay? 50. Lad McConkey has a super senior year based off his injury habits right now, probably coming back. Let's put a question mark by him. You see where I'm going, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Carson Beck, we got a question mark on him. Dejan Edwards, super senior, question mark. Does he? Does he? I, don't know. I think everyone he, does. He's on the 2020 roster. Yeah, but I think he's put enough tape on. All right, so Dejan Edwards. So let's sure. let's call Dejan Edwards an exit. All right, let's call him an out. All right, so we have one, two, three starters out. Brock Bowers out. Right, obviously to the NFL. That's four starters out. Dom Lovett. Dom Lovett. I don't know, but let's call it. Let's call it a question mark there. All trust. right. So everybody else. He said trust. Trust. Yeah, trust is gone. But hey, yeah, Monroe Freeland looks like he's going to be all right right there. Um, Ernest Green coming back. Uh, Tate Ratmush probably gone, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so there you go. You, you're going to lose. You're going to lose four or five starters offensively, but you, you keep some real mainstays is what I was trying to get to um, there. Especially if Rao Rao and Dominic Lovett decide to come back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that would be that'd be huge. That'd be huge, and they. I would imagine they came. I, how would they know? But they know now that they have a quarterback, and they know, like. Here, here's what here's what could happen. You know, I'm glad we had this conversation because we just talked ourselves into it. By the way, guys, we were just mentioning NFL guys on the offensive side of the football, not defensively. I'm glad we had this conversation because these next five games of this regular season. Robert Ra Thomas and Dominic Lovett get to see what an offense is going to look like next year without uh, Brock Bowers. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good point. And if their workload looks like, damn, if I come back next year, I might have a 900-yard season. Like, maybe Dominic Lovett is never a traitsy enough dude to be a first-round NFL draft pick, which is probably true. But Robert Ra Thomas damn sure is. Yeah. If Robert Ra Thomas has a 950-yard season next year, he might be a top 40 pick. And that's the difference, you know, that's, that's multi-millions of dollars of difference right there between those two. Here's a, question, here's a question I'm thinking just off the top of my head. If Carson does come back, yeah. does the fan base have open arms to him? Uh, because yeah, because of the way he's played this year. But you better. there's always going to be the tendency of the fan base that says, oh, well, this might cost us Brock Vandergriff. Yeah. Or this might cause us Gunnar Stockton. And here's, here's how I've always addressed, and, and this will be our, our show's consistent viewpoint and standpoint on this forever. If you get beat out and leave, you got beat out. They, they, they kept the better player. So whatever happens moving forward, we're not going to play revisionist history. I think that's unfair on decision makers at the school. But if the starter wants to come back and you lose the backup, you lost the backup. If he goes somewhere else and becomes a superstar as a starter, you just can't – I'm not going to allow you to play revisionist history every single time it happens. That's just, that's just going to make you insane as a fan base. And because no, you have Kirby Smart as your head coach, your quarterback room would still be in tremendous shape. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking back to when Stetson Bennett announced that he was coming back, how it was met with oh, such negative response. And he was fresh off the first natty in 40 years. And it was negative response and thoughts from my mentions that he was going to cost Brock Vandergriff. Yeah. Not because they were worried about Carson Beck. I, th I think it's so funny. Well, because he threw the interception against UAB. <coughs> yeah, he threw that interception against UAB and loafed, even though the guy was 25 yards downfield in a game that they were up 35 in in the middle of the third quarter. Um, Hell, they were up 52 in. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot of points they were up by in that football game, and he loafed, and, and everyone got mad about it. Um, but, no, I, I think it's been – it's, I'm, I'm glad that he's had the success he's had and the immediate, almost immediate success that he's had uh, because, man, he, I think he's had it rough. And, and not that people were mean to him or anything. It's just that everyone overlooked Carson. Everyone has always overlooked yeah. Carson. They're still overlooking Carson. I still have people in my mentions. And I know they're the, they're the very vocal minority. I understand that. But they exist, man. They exist. There were people we, on our way back home from Vandy. There was a guy on Twitter that was getting flamed up for talking about this Carson Beck experiment needs to be over with. Yeah. Experiment? Dog, it's the, it's the, it's the offense right now. It's, it's the offense what's left it's now. It's the past, the future, the present. Yeah, dog. My, so I guess my nuts. worry is, is if Georgia doesn't three-peat, that's going to, for whatever reason, we already know, it's going to fall on Mike Bobo and Carson Beck. 
Yeah. No matter what. A- any loss. Shit. Any, At any, this point, I think it should fall on the defense. Well, that's – but I'm saying the public is going to make it fall yeah. on Carson Beck. So, if you're coming off of where you came short in the natty and Carson Beck then comes back, I think it gets really dicey fan base-wise just because that's the way they are. Hmm. I mean, even even in, in the SEC championship game when Stetson Bennett threw for, what, 350 yards and the defense let up 41 points, he got the flack of it because it's Stetson Bennett. There is a chance next year Carson Beck – Brock Vandergriff, Gunnar Stockton, uh, our guy Jackson Muschamp, okay, uh, Dylan Rayola, okay, and Ryan Puglisi could all be in the same quarterback room. What, what are the, the odds? hell do you slim. do with reps? Slim, slim. <laughs> what do you do with reps? Yeah, holy cow. Honestly, I would just go ahead and offer up uh, Rayola and Puglisi red shirts and yeah. say, hey, we're gonna let you some bitches get live reps down there against that scout team all year. Yeah, like that I, would be sick. I think I think the foregone conclusion is also if Beck comes back, you're losing Brock Vandergriff. Yeah, I don't love to do that. I don't do that. Um, in fact, on this channel, I've never tossed guys to the portal. Um, I don't think it's fair. But history, I've always said this. History says they they shouldn't even have done what they've done now. No, absolutely. History not. says one of them should already been gone. Yeah. So like. Shoot, history says two of them should have yeah, already Carson, been gone. History says Carson Beck shouldn't have, should have left your roster after 2021. And history says Brock Vandergriff should have hit the portal this summer. Yeah, so that's Brock that's Vandergriff should be the starting quarterback at Auburn right now. If you talk to an Auburn fan, yeah, so that's what should be happening. But so I know that's crazy. Dogs. I think it's even crazy that you've held on to all those guys. Mm-hmm. Maybe you sure. continue to do so. Hey, we've got a whole nother hour coming up. NBR, nothing but rants, our national hour. Look, we got a loaded group in here. There's a bunch of y'all. Please give us a shot. Give us a shot to be your national hour, uh, local show, uh, whatever you want to call it. Give us a chance to be your national analyst here on college football. We'll see y'all over there.